Bonjour, euh, au nom de l'amicale autochtone de l'UCO, euh, je vais vous remercier de, de, de venir à la conférence. Euh, euh, l'amicale autochtone de l'UCO, on est une organisation étudiante ici à l'UCO qui ont bien de créer, et même c'est la première activité autonome qu'ils ont fait à l'université. Euh, nous allons faire beaucoup plus d'activités euh, la session prochaine et même. Euh, et nous allons vous, vous envoyer l'information euh, au moment qui correspond. Et euh, donc, euh, nous voulons vous remercier votre présence ici. Nous voulons remercier aussi euh, la présence de José et Louis, euh, et aussi le support de l'université, et aussi le support des différents réseaux euh, qui ont partagé l'information. Euh, et même, j'imagine que. Parmi vous, il y a quelqu'un qui a connu de, de cette conférence à partir d'une autre question d'information. Donc, euh, euh, c'est une bonne chose. Et euh, José Elwin, euh, il vient du Chili, un avocat chilien spécialisé sur le sujet des peuples autochtones, des droits des peuples autochtones, et euh, qui est très connu, reconnu euh, au Chili, et même en Amérique latine. Euh, il, il a fait ses, ses études ici aussi. Euh, en, Columbia, et il a fait des études euh, euh, de comparaison entre la situation des de droits des peuples autochtones au Canada et euh, au Chili. Et, il est une personne qui a beaucoup influencé la, 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 les avances qu'il y a au Chili par rapport à la situation des de droits des peuples autochtones. Et euh, dernièrement, euh, il est le co-directeur de, de l'Observatoire des citoyens du de, de Chili. Euh, qui a un volet pour la situation des droits des peuples autochtones et aussi il travaille comme professeur à l'université australe de, de Chili, euh, professeur des droits humains, euh, des droits des peuples autochtones et, et il a aussi travaillé euh, dans plusieurs d'organismes de, 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 de droits humains en Amérique latine comme la Cour interaméricaine des droits humains et d'autres organismes internationaux des Nations Unies et donc la, la conférence euh, sur les droits des peuples autochtones et sur le territoire et les ressources naturelles euh, en Amérique latine, bah, on va voir les lois et la pratique. Et la conférence va se tenir en, en, en anglais. Donc je vais vous, je vais vous, vous remercier de votre, votre présence. Merci beaucoup. Well, uh, good evening. Um, Saludos à tous. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't speak French. Um, So I've been told that um, English would be the, the best. Uh, so I've uh, prepared my presentation in English. I've, I've been I'm really uh, glad and uh, thankful to Amical Abdul Tong uh, for having invited me here. Um, and also Gonzalo Bustamante, a friend of mine, a person who has worked uh, with the indigenous peoples of Chile. and. Uh, Uh, who made the link with uh, this university and this organization to, to be here. Um, I, I am a non-Aboriginal person, I'm a lawyer by training, and I have worked for a number of years with indigenous peoples in Chile and in Latin America. And uh, I, I have uh, had the opportunity to Uh, be connected to many indigenous peoples, uh, north and south, and uh, and to follow and to, in many ways, to provide some advice on some occasions on indigenous struggles for uh, recognition and more recently for uh, for also also for autonomy and for self-government uh, in a context which is very complex, as you know probably very, in many ways, similar to the context that indigenous peoples face here in, in Canada and in, and in Quebec too. So um, I would like to talk about the, the issues that I'm dealing with uh, at home, um, that I have worked, and, um, and basically uh, try to highlight the, the, the gap existing between uh, the legal evolution concerning indigenous peoples and their rights, and, and on the other hand, um, the practice, um, uh, which is in many ways a, a huge contradiction, uh, a big gap, and 
um, and a gap which is uh, also generates conflicts and conflicts with, which are on many occasions have been criminalized and, and uh, have uh, are the cause uh, of uh, indigenous persecution and prosecution and, and indigenous leaders in imprisonment. Um, so maybe start by saying that um, uh, in this paradoxical context, uh, in this paradoxical context can be um, uh, highlighted with two different uh, events that occurred in, in the last years in Latin America concerning indigenous peoples. On the one hand, uh, in 2005, um, for the first time, uh, an indigenous self and a self-identified indigenous leader, uh, Evo Morales, uh, uh, in a country where demography is largely indigenous, uh, was elected as uh, president of Bolivia. Uh, in a process which, of course, uh, um, was a consequence of the organization and the struggles of indigenous peoples uh, of that country in alliance with uh, progressive sectors of uh, Bolivia. Evo Morales uh, was re-elected in 2010 and won uh, close to 60% of the votes in, in, in Bolivia. So that talks of, uh, um, of a of a, a project which uh, was not a short time project but apparently seems to be like a long term project which talks of, the, of a means of exercising self-government uh, and self-determination of indigenous peoples in the context of Bolivia. Probably as you might know there's also conflicts in Bolivia, we'll talk about that and uh, it, it is not that that project is without any conflict. But, but on the other hand Parallel to this process, which uh, took uh, enabled an indigenous person to become the first elected, democratically elected president in the region, uh, in a neighboring country in Peru, uh, in the context of uh, free trade agreements which were entered um, by the government of Peru with uh, the United States. Uh, the president of the uh, country, by that time, Alan Garcia, uh, passed uh, close to 100 uh, law decrees, which are a faculty which is granted by the legislative power to the president, to the executive power, in order to enable him, in this case, uh, to issue this uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, decrees. And these legislative decrees were aimed basically at adjusting uh, Peruvian legislation in order to make possible the implementation of the free trade agreement that was signed with the United States. And this free trade agreement was strongly, and this de decrees were strongly, which basically opened uh, the Amazon area for investment, which opened also the Andean region for uh, extractive in investment, uh, triggered the opposition of uh, indigenous peoples of the Amazon in the area of Bagua. And this process of social protest resulted in the killing of 30 uh, people, most of them indigenous in the area of Bagua. So I, I try to uh, exemplify the tensions and the contradictory trends which nowadays are uh, visible in Latin America in these two events. Uh, the fact that on the one hand, uh, an indigenous person was elected as a president, but on the other hand, uh, this other trend which talks about uh, the insertion of Latin American states into global economy and their impacts on indigenous peoples. So, uh, so I'll try to, to, to provide with some historical background that you know that there's several people that come from Latin America and some others were We've studied Latin America, but uh, let, let us start by, by saying that this possession of lands and resources is not a new issue in, in, in Latin America. It's not a new issue for indigenous peoples worldwide. Uh, and it started obviously with, with, um, with colonization, uh, with the arrival of Spaniards uh, uh, to most of Latin America, what today are Latin American states and, 
to the arrival with the arrival of the Portuguese. And, and aside from wars of conquest, uh, they brought several institutions which were basically institutions which resulted in the dispossession of indigenous peoples from their lands and resources. Uh, being the encomienda or the repartimiento, uh, uh, an institution which was uh, um, uh, established from uh, Mexico down to Chile. And basically this was an institution uh, which uh, in theory did not uh, consist in land uh, allocation, but basically it was an allocation of native people uh, which should pay a, a tribute uh, to the encomendero. Uh, and this is an institution which was very much framed, uh, a feudal institution which came from Europe. But in fact, encomienda resulted in the relocation of indigenous peoples into pueblos de indios or Indian towns, so-called Indian towns, and in the appropriation of the traditional lands by, uh, by the, the, the Spaniards. Uh, uh, also, institution, institutions such as uh, uh, Merced de Tierra or, or Mercy titles, which were granted for the Spanish soldier after they had won this conquest wars, were a means of appropriating lands which, theoretically speaking, were supposed to be uh, unoccupied, but in practice were uh, the traditional territories of indigenous peoples. And in the context of, uh, of Brazil, uh, there was another institution, the Ses Maria, which was uh, a session of lands, theoretically speaking, to uh, unoccupied by indigenous peoples. And, and after five years, so Ses Maria uh, resulted in, uh, in, 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 in property rights which were granted by, by the Portuguese crown to uh, the um, Portuguese soldiers or port Portuguese settlers. And this uh, forms of appropriation continued and in fact were intensified throughout the Republican states um, uh, by several means, uh, wars of uh, uh, expansion, geopolitics, uh, the creation of the concept of the so-called concept of the nation state, uh, um, were resulted in many occasions in, in the relocation, in the uh, in, in some occasions even in genocides of indigenous peoples, uh, such as that which occurred w with uh, the Mapuche, particularly in, in the southern part of Argentina, or that which resulted in, in the, uh, also in the genocide in, in, of the Selknam of Tierra del Fuego, and in many other contexts of, of Latin America. Uh, then policies of, uh, uh, of um, confinement were implemented in, in many places, and in fact, there's a lot of analogies with the reservation policy in the United States and with, with reserves that were established in, in, in Canada. Uh, and uh, these were, were policies aimed basically at allowing the settlement of uh, non-indigenous peoples, uh, particularly European settlers, in, particularly in the southern cone. Uh, so, so, so the whole idea of leaving a, setting aside reserves was a means to enable the um, occupation, the settlement by non-indigenous people. Um, and, and it's interesting to also that the, throughout the 20th century, uh, many Latin American states uh, implemented uh, agrarian reforms. Uh, from since uh, 1911, when Mexico, since the Mexican Revolution, um, many states uh, implemented agrarian reforms uh, which in, in some occasions resulted in a, the allocation of lands of, uh, of for indigenous peoples, but re agrarian reforms were not aimed at uh, restituting lands for indigenous peoples, were focused on, on landless peasants and, and indigenous peoples who were not treated uh, 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 collectively, but were treated as landless peasants and were on many occasions uh, granted lands uh, which were not their traditional lands, which were lands granted lands along with other sectors of the population uh, which were not necessarily indigenous and were, so were treated as peasants and as a mean also of integrating indigenous peoples into larger uh, societies. So this is a process that went on throughout the 20th century and in fact there's, certain, there's some states where na until nowadays agrarian reforms still uh, um, continue to be implemented. 
with all the positive impacts in terms of providing lands to landless people, but but the, there are many questions raised in terms of uh, the impacts on uh, on ethnicity and on indigenous peoples, uh, which were, were not treated as such. However, the uh, uh, indigenous peoples in the last decades have uh, have resisted uh, the state, um, notwithstanding the policies of indigenismo, which were encouraged by Mexico, particularly, but w which were spread throughout the continent, uh, which encouraged uh, the integration of indigenous peoples into larger society. Indigenous peoples have uh, have have remained, have have resisted these policies of in integration, and have, uh, in fact. Uh, organized uh, from the local level till the, the state level and to the global level at different, in different means, in different forms, and, uh, and have, been, have become, in many countries, in many states, indigenous peoples have become a relevant pol political actor, uh, and have been able uh, to build alliances with other peoples and with, with larger societies or with discriminated sectors of society and have been able also to, uh, um, to have their rights recognized uh, uh, after centuries of denial and after centuries of dispossession. Uh, there's uh, Raquel Irigoyen, who's a, um, a legal anthropologist from Peru, identifies three cycles of uh, what many have called the so-called reform of the Latin American states uh, in order to, uh, to, to uh, give some kind of recognition to its diversity, to its ethnical and cultural diversity. Uh, the, the first of these cycles of reform uh, took place in the 80s. Uh, and uh, this prior to um, the passing of Convention 169 of the International Labor Organization, which is the only international convention dealing specifically with indigenous peoples and their rights. And, um, and was a consequence of different phenomena. So for instance, in Guatemala, it was a consequence of the civil war, uh, where those who were most affected were indigenous peoples of the Maya of Guatemala. Was a consequence also, in the case of uh, Nicaragua, of uh, the struggles of the Miskito, uh, against, interestingly, uh, against the, the Sandinista revolution, which was uh, a revolution which uh, had a socialist per perspective, a Marxist perspective, but, but really uh, had, was a revolution that had troubles in, in including uh, different categories aside from that of uh, laborers, peasants, and, and uh, oppressors. And, uh, so it did not really take into account the fact that half of Nicaragua was inhabited by indigenous peoples and, and that uh, the mosquitoes and other indigenous peoples of the Atlantic coast uh, did not fit into these categories. So um, uh, there was a, um, a new constitution which was passed in 1987 and after uh, clashes among the mosquito and the state of the Sandinistas which controlled the state of Nicaragua at the time uh, there was uh, some recognition, to the ex first of all, to the existence of uh, indigenous peoples and, and also uh, to the fact that they had their own lands and, and, and that they uh, had the right to uh, control their territory. So the first recognition of an autonomous regime was uh, made by the constitution of uh, 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 Nicaragua in 1987. And another uh, reality which uh, was uh, Another first form of recognition was that which was, was made by Brazil in its constitution in 1988. And in the context of uh, struggles for the preservation of the Amazon, uh, which was and continued to be threatened by uh, forest developments, by hydro dams, and, and, uh, and in alliance with environmental groups and uh, the indigenous peoples were able to obtain uh, recognition as such as peoples and, and recognition of their lands uh, and a recognition of uh, use rights or use of rights over their, over their resources. However, the Constitution of Brazil is a very interesting con constitution because uh, it acknowledged in 88 uh, what Canadian courts have uh, 
recognized uh, as Aboriginal title. The fact that whenever the indigenous peoples prove that they had that they have ancestral property over their lands, it, it is those lands are considered to be indigenous, and the state has to demarcate those lands. However, uh, the Constitution of uh, Brazil considers those lands to be uh, to be state-owned lands and not uh, lands owned by the indigenous people. So these were the first, the first cycle of uh, uh, recognition of uh, indigenous peoples in, in the early 80s. Uh, th there's a second wave, uh, which uh, it was very much influenced by Convention 169 and took place in, in the 90s. Convention 169 was passed in 89, and, and as you, some of you might know, acknowledges the existence of indigenous peoples uh, rights to um, self-identification, political rights, some forms of autonomy, uh, customary rights, uh, rights to justice in accordance to, to, to those uh, customary uh, um, norms, and, and also rights to lands and, and resources. Uh, so uh, this uh, several constitution, most of the constitutions of Latin America, in fact, were re- um, were reformed during this period, during the 90s, and from Mexico in 91 to Venezuela in 201, uh, they acknowledged that, uh, uh, the, that uh, the existence of different peoples, in some cases they acknowledged the existence of uh, these peoples as pre-existing peoples, and that has very relevant legal implications, because when the Constitution acknowledges that indigenous peoples are pre-existing, that means that their rights to lands and rights to resources are also pre-existing, so they should prevail uh, to those rights which have been granted by the, the state. Uh, so this, aside from the recognition of peoples, they, they also recognize lands, in some cases territories, and the duty of the state to demarcate those lands, to, to regularize those, those lands, and, and to entitle these lands in a collective way. They, they also acknowledge some forms of uh, rights to over natural, over renewable natural resources. Non-renewable, renewable natural resources are considered by Latin American states as being a property of, of the state, and so it's only uh, these constitutions only acknowledge uh, rights over renewable natural resources, including usufructory rights and rights to consultation prior to the. Uh, implementation of uh, resource developments or resource uh, extractions. Uh, and in some cases, too, uh, 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 regimes of autonomy were acknowledged. It's, this is a case of Mexico, and, and of course, Mexico is a federal state, and some states have, uh, um, have uh, developed uh, internal or domestic legislation which has enabled, for instance, in the state of Oaxaca, very relevant forms of municipal autonomy. And, and on the other hand, uh, the, 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 uh, the case of uh, Colombia, where resguardos, which are a traditional space of land which was acknowledged during the colonial regime to the indigenous peoples, in accordance to, to the constitution of uh, 1991, are considered to be also autonomous spaces. And in many ways, they have a similar status to a municipality. Uh, however, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, so-called multicultural reforms, and it's interesting um, to reflect on this term, which was used in many, many of the constitutions of the 90s, uh, that considered the states to be multicultural or, or pluricultural, uh, which was a concept which was not, which did not emerge from Latin America. This is a concept which, that, as you probably know, was uh, built in the Northern Hemisphere, in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, which is in the Southern Hemisphere, but it's in the Northern culture, and, and by New Zealand. So this notion of multiculturalism was exported by the World Bank, by the Inter-American Development Bank, and was taken by 
Latin American states uh, to promote uh, the notion of multiculturality. However, this multiculturality didn't really change, uh, notwithstanding the recognition of peoples and their rights, did not result into a, a change in, in, in the paradigms and did, did not result in a change in terms of uh, the forms of relation between the non-indigenous dominant elites and the indigenous uh, peoples which continue to be marginalized and continue to be dispossessed. This in a context of the Washington consensus and in a context when policies were implemented by states basically in a process of opening their markets into global economy uh, and uh, Latin America inserts into global economy basically by exporting uh, natural resources and those natural resources are largely located on indigenous territories. So notwithstanding the recognitions of the second cycle, the multicultural cycle, uh, the forms of relationship between the indigenous and non-indigenous did not change and clashes emerged and there was a huge frustration by indigenous peoples and, and indigenous peoples are um, also the former UN uh, a special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, Rodolfo Sarenhagen, a Mexican anthropologist, uh, identified the existence in, in this period of what he calls an implementation gap. There was this fantastic law, uh, fantastic constitutions, in some cases, and some other they were not so fantastic, but, but this did not result in policy implementation, in legal uh, uh, regulation, or, or the states did not devote sufficient funds for, in order to enable transformations. And so this resulted in different strategies by indi different indigenous peoples, ranging from resistance, the case of Chiapas is the, probably the best known case in, in, the, in, in, the, mid, uh, in the mid 2000, uh, 2004, in, in the context of uh, the and when, when the free trade agreement with the U.S. entered into effect. And another example of resistance is the resistance of the Mapuche in the south of Chile, particularly against uh, the expansion of forest plantations which devastated their ecosystems and, and their, their communities. And, but however, there's some other countries where indigenous strategies were different. And, and, and this had a lot to do with demography too. The fact that in the Andean states, indigenous peoples are uh, not a minority, but are uh, on many occasions, on many cases, particularly in Bolivia, particularly in, in the Andes, they are a large ma majority. So they d implemented the policy of uh, participating on politics, building alliances, uh, um, taking uh, their leaders to Congress, such as in the case of Ecuador, um, winning um, municipalities, controlling municipalities, or entering into glo into uh, into state politics, such as the case of uh, uh, Bolivia, and it was precisely as a consequence of uh, this strategy, which, uh, at least in two contexts, there have been uh, uh, what we could call, or Raquel Irigoyen names names, the third cycle of reforms. And this is the, the case of uh, Bolivia and the case of Ecuador, where as a consequence of uh, indigenous uh, struggles, as a con consequence of indigenous participation, uh, the, um, um, the, the, the indigenous movements were able to, uh, to participate in the reform of the state through the, uh, a process, a democratic process, which included uh, a, a constitutional assemblies and place besides for uh, the ratification of those uh, constitutional assembly uh, proposals, uh, of re reform proposals. So uh, in 2008 and in 2009, uh, Ecuador and Bolivia approved new constitutions. And these constitutions are, um, for the first time ever, well, they, they left aside the, the, the notion of multiculturalism and promoted and proposed uh, the reform at the end 
of the uh, concept of the nation state, which is a fiction. And it, this is a concept which is very mu much used in political science up until today. And there's very few countries worldwide which are really a nation state. You can count them with uh, the fingers in, in your hand. Uh, and uh, it's not the case of Latin America. It's not the case of North America either. There have never been nation states. and so. Uh, these uh, constitutions dismantled the nation, the, the, the notion of the nation state, and proposed the notion of the uh, uh, plurinational states. And also proposed as a form of relationship between uh, indigenous and non indigenous peoples uh, interculturality, interculturality or interculturalism and not multiculturalism. Uh, of course, this is a proposal which has to be built. But it's reflected in many ways in these constitutions, and uh, uh, in, in, for instance, uh, certain uh, concepts which are proposed, indigenous concepts which are proposed as concepts not only for the indigenous peoples but for the society as a whole, such, such as the concept of good vivir or good living uh, in, the con in, in the constitution of uh, Ecuador, or such as the same concept and other indigenous concepts. Uh, uh, in, the, in the constitution of uh, Bol Bolivia. For instance, uh, uh, don't be lazy, don't be liar, don't be robber, or good living, harmonious life, good life, uh, land without evil, which is a concept of Guarani, Guarani people, who are nomadic people who search uh, lands that have no evil. Uh, and this has made the Guarani people uh, uh, communities to, to move from the Andes to the, the Atlantic, for instance, in the surroundings of the city of Sao Paulo. And uh, the rights to nature, which is a really uh, questions the paradigm that rights are only rights of people and peoples, individual or collective rights, but, but are also uh, rights that correspond to nature. And uh, the constitution of uh, Ecuador acknowledges this right to nature and creates uh, uh, a mechanism to enforce uh, or to demand the state uh, uh, to enforce the rights to, to, to nature. Um, and I, in the case of, and I'll end up with the legal dimension and talk about practice, which of course uh, the, there's, I, as I mentioned initially, there's a huge gap between these two. Um, but I think it's relevant uh, to, to have an understanding of how um, indigenous peoples have been able to uh, to transform the, these states which were imposed obviously by the non-indigenous uh, elites. Uh, um, one issue which is central in these constitutions is, is the issue of, uh, of land and resource rights. And, and both constitutions are um, also uh, reform the, 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 the or, or make a lot of progress with, when compared to those recognitions that were made by the multicultural constitutions of the 1990s. Uh, the, the concept of ancestral ownership of lands is, is contained in, in both uh, constitutions. And, and this uh, notion of ancestral domains or ancestral lands uh, has uh, uh, at the legal level uh, huge implications. Uh, uh, traditionally, Latin American states have only acknowledged uh, as, as indigenous those lands and those territories which have been entitled by the state to in the indigenous peoples. In this case, uh, both constitutions acknowledge as uh, the, those lands belonging to indigenous peoples those that emerge from traditional uh, possession. And, and uh, acknowledge the duty of the states to entitle indigenous peoples these lands where they have a traditional or ancestral possession. Uh, they also acknowledge the rights to administration and conservation, again, of renewable natural resources, non-renewable natural resources, uh, continue to be in the hands of or, or in control of the state. And this, of course, has generated huge uh, conflicts in, in, many, in, 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 in many states of Latin America, including, of course, Ecuador and Bolivia, 
uh, particularly in these two contexts, uh, in the case of oil exploitation. Um, the right to free and prior informed consultation. Uh, the, neither of the two uh, constitutions talk about what we will see later, uh, this uh, concept and right which has been acknowledged by uh, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Human Rights Court in several cases in, in, in the region and also by the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, uh, which is a, a right to free prior informed consent uh, because there's a difference between consulting someone and, and having the obligation to have the consent of a uh, they, uh, the Constitution of Ecuador acknowledges the, the, the right to participate in profits earned by projects or to receive compensation uh, of the damages provoked by, uh, 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 by projects in, in their lands and, and their territories. And, and uh, both constitutions, particularly the, the, the one of the Constitution of Bolivia, acknowledges forms of self-government and self-control of the lands and territories that have been uh, uh, recognized to indigenous peoples. Um, in this case, I won't go through uh, the same rights in the case of Bolivia, because they're very, very similarly framed, but the, the difference is that the Constitution of Bolivia acknowledges the right to self-determination. And as an expression of the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples, forms of, of autonomy. And it's interesting because in the context of Bolivia, uh, the uh, process, the political process led by Evo Morales has found a huge resistance by the uh, non-native uh, elites from the lowlands of Santa Cruz. And uh, these elites have claimed also uh, rights to self-government on their rights, uh, on their lands, and they have even proposed uh, forms of uh, separation from the rest of Bolivia. So the Constitution of Bolivia uh, generated or acknowledges like four levels of autonomy, going from the department autonomy to the munis municipal autonomy to the peasant and indigenous autonomy, and, and generates a mechanism in accordance to which lands, indigenous lands, can become uh, forms of self-government, forms of uh, uh, autonomy. Uh, so it, it's much more clear than the Constitution of Ecuador to, to this regard. Um, just very briefly talk of the fact that, because I'm, these, are, these are these three cycles, but uh, in some cases the, the, the I mean, this last cycle only refers to the context of Bolivia and Ecuador. However, uh, there's been an international evolution, worldwide and regional evolution, which uh, uh, might allow us to say that these rights, basically the right to self-determination, uh, the rights to lands and resources, uh, the, the rights to, of ancestral um, ownership of these uh, uh, rights to lands and resources, uh, the right to participate on benefits, are not only rights uh, acknowledged for in the context of Bolivia and Ecuador, but in accordance to these international standards and decisions made by the Inter-American Human Rights Court, they are standards which are uh, at least um, common to the region. And this includes, interestingly enough, the context of Canada, because uh, the, the Canada is a, a member of the OES, and, and Canada, although Canada has not acknowledged the jurisdiction of the court, uh, has acknowledged the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And the court has four cases which are, have uh, systematically, since the, the, the early 2000, acknowledged rights of ancestral ownership over lands traditionally possessed by indigenous peoples. Nicaragua, the case of Agustin in Nicaragua, two cases in, in Paraguay, and the case of the Saramaca people of Suriname. 
And interestingly, this last case deals with large developments on indigenous lands and, uh, and generates a criteria in accordance to which indigenous peoples have the right to free prior informed consent whenever large developments, it talks about large developments, uh, are, um, are proposed or, ter or are uh, taking place in, in indigenous territories. And it only, uh, the Saramaka case, uh, uh, acknowledges the right to participation on benefits uh, of this uh, uh, large development. And finally, they, the, the Saramaka case acknowledges uh, rights to compensation whenever damages are provoked by, by this uh, large de developments. But this is slow, and I, sorry, this is uh, it is, um, um, a table which interestingly was uh, elaborated by the Inter-American Development Bank, which of course is, is a bank, it's not a, but since uh, um, uh, the whole conflict between the bank policies and indigenous peoples uh, uh, became so strong, this bank uh, implemented a, uh, what they called the uh, well, Center for Information of Indigenous Peoples. And, and this is a graph which talks of uh, the standard of, the quality <laughs> standard of, uh, or quality, uh, the quality of uh, indigenous legislation in the region. This is the last year in which was elaborated, so it doesn't include the constitutions and the, the amendments in, in the context of Ecuador and Bolivia, but uh, it, the, the countries which have ranked the best would be Colombia, uh, uh, Bolivia, Peru, the Andean countries, and uh, uh, the countries which rank the worst would be the, the countries which have a lower a number or a smaller number of indigenous peoples. In the case of Uruguay, for instance, where indigenous peoples were also exterminated. And Chile, which has close to 10% of the population being indigenous, ranks really at, at the, the bottom of this. However, this is law, and, uh, and I've mentioned that um, uh, we should look at, whenever you, should, you, you look at law, you should look at practice, uh, public policies, uh, gaps between law and reality. And of course you have huge gaps. You have some progress and it's interesting to, to, to deal with some of the progress, to, uh, to acknowledge that there is some progress being made. I focus on, on a research I've done uh, recently on, on the cases, on three cases, Bolivia, Brazil, and Chile, which are different states, different realities, different demographies. Uh, but this, this talks of uh, um, the regularization of, an, of lands in general uh, that started in 94, uh, and this is a graph of 209 in, in Bolivia. And the, the category of uh, indigenous lands are tierras comunitarias de origen. And there have been uh, 15 million hectares. Uh, out of a total 37 million hectares, uh, uh, that have been regularized for indigenous people. There's a map of Bolivia with numbers, if you don't see them. Uh, the, the red um, uh, spaces are those lands which have been entitled as tierras comunitarias de origen, collected property uh, for indigenous peoples. That the lands in, in, in brown are lands which are demanded by indigenous peoples but still have not been uh, uh, regularized, uh, still have not been entitled. Um, uh, so this is very impressive. It, it's almost uh, half of, of uh, Bolivia, which is in the process of being uh, uh, entitled collectively to indigenous peoples. Uh, well, this uh, is, uh, you have to take into consideration that in, in the case of Bolivia, uh, the official statistic is 60% of the population is indigenous, but unofficially it's 80% of the population which is uh, indigenous. So, so half of, of the land base, uh, it's a minimum. Uh, however, in the process of demarcation, there's many, many difficulties which have arised. Uh, among them, uh, the fact that 
many non-indigenous people living within these pieces of land have been th their 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 property rights have been uh, legitimized by this process of regularization. The fact that um, um, and you might have heard of a recent conflict with a protected area, uh, which is uh, 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 which totally coincides with with a, a tierra comunitaria de origen. Uh, there was a highway being proposed by Evo Morales uh, in those lands, and and there's an overlap of uh, lands which are claimed by indigenous peoples with lands which are declared as being uh, protected areas. There's also um, um, for until the constitution of 208, uh, there the was indigenous peoples had ownership, collective ownership, but did not have self-government or control of their lives within those lands. The constitution enables this TCO or Tierras Comunitarias de Origen to become uh, autonomous regime. However, very, very few of these TCO or Tierras Comunitarias de Origen have become uh, uh, in fact, autonomous forms of government. So they overlap with municipalities, with departments, and they, so the, the ownership does not mean control. Add to this developments, particularly in the context of Bolivia, uh, oil developments. Uh, uh, there's legislation that was enacted in 205 uh, that generated it was a legislation related to oil investment and to oil ex exploitation and generated a, a fund for indigenous peoples. Five percent of the revenues of the oil exploration or sorry exploitation should go to a fund uh, managed by indigenous peoples and uh, there's evidence that this fund has generated not sufficient funding and that this funding has not gone particularly to those communities that have been affected by oil uh, by oil explorations. The context of Brazil, uh, there's a Brazilian um, process of demarcation started in the 88 so, and, and it's interesting that there's a huge mass of land which has been demarcated as indigenous lands that as previously mentioned are not owned by the indigenous peoples but are, are, are owned by the state. And uh, probably those numbers, 110 million hectares, uh, doesn't talk that much, but if you see this map, the green spaces are indigenous lands. Uh, in accordance to the Constitution of 1988. It's 13% of the land mass of Brazil, and in the Amazon area, it's 20% of the Amazon area. And indigenous peoples are less than 1% of the population. So this generates a lot of conflict with investors, with the militaries, who uh, question the allocation of this land for the, the indigenous peoples in about 700 in, indigenous lands. But again, there's huge conflicts in many of these uh, territories, in many of these lands. And they have to do, again, with invasions. Uh, there's, there's statistics that more than 80% of these indigenous lands demarcated by the state are have some forms of invasion. Or even they're scouting invaders, mining diggers and rivers, or, or they're uh, people who, who, forest companies, or the people who are Clear, clearing the forest, or, or in the context of uh, the south, uh, it's the expansion of the biofuels, which are being promoted by the government of Lula, so-called so socialist, uh, in, in the context of Brazil, with a lot of uh, um, investments, transnational investments, uh, in, in the case of Brazil. And finally, the case of Chile, uh, which is a country which doesn't have a constitutional recognition of indigenous peoples nor their rights, which is a country that has, uh, um, has uh, along with Mexico and Peru, is a country which has a, a policy uh, of opening markets uh, uh, more intensive. Uh, Chile has signed more than 50 free trade agreements with large economies, including Canada, 
the US, the European Union, China, and so on. And Chile's legal framework is a framework which, which uh, promotes uh, uh, land protection, at least legally, and the, the expansion uh, or the amplification of indigenous land base, but through market policies. Uh, this is uh, through a process of purchases that are made uh, by the state on an annual ba basis according to, uh, to, to funds allocated for this purpose. And throughout the, the last 15 years, uh, uh, there's close to, to 300 million US dollars, uh, and there's a land base of uh, uh, approximately uh, 130 southern hectares which have been amplified. The rest of them, it's a so called transfer of, of public lands, fiscal lands, but, but in fact, that is basically the recognition or the entitlement of ancestral lands, which the state confiscated a century ago and considers to be fiscal, but in, in practice these are traditionally uh, uh, indigenous owned lands. Uh, um, and this goes aside with a policy of uh, uh, inclusion into foreign markets, uh, and as I said initially, uh, there's a total correlation between those natural resources that and in, the, in this case, Chile exports. Uh, this is a common pattern in Latin America, but Chile is probably uh, uh, the best example of this pattern. Uh, there's mining, which is located in the northern part of the country, in, in the territory which is in gray, uh, which is the territory of the Atacamenian people. There's uh, copper mines, there's uh, uh, silver mines, uh, um, there's all sorts of uh, uh, minerals which are being uh, um, exploited both by state-owned companies and by transnational companies, including Canadian companies. And in the case of the South of the country, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, the red dots uh, are uh, uh, lands which were allocated as uh, reserves or reducciones in the, in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, and the belts are uh, basically the expansion of uh, forest industry with more than two million hectares when compared to half a million uh, uh, hectares, uh, uh, southern hectares, half a million yeah, hectares, which are in the hands of uh, the Mapuche people in the south. And uh, this, of course, has generated lots of conflicts and uh, social protest and social protest as it has occurred in Peru and, and as it has occurred also more recently, even in Ecuador, uh, by a government which was uh, supported initially by the indigenous peoples have resulted in a process of criminalization of social protest, prosecution of the leaders, and application of anti-terrorist legislation. Critical aspects, I've mentioned them, lack of resources for allocated by the states for the regularization, demarcation, and entitlement of indigenous lands, legitimation of private interests in the process of demarcation and regularization, use of market mechanisms uh, to implement the duty of states to restitute lands to indigenous peoples, the ancestral lands of indigenous peoples. Uh, the persistence, of Brazil is a case of persistence of state control over lands, and not only over lands, but over people. Brazil has a, a policy of tutelage, a policy of control of people and the indigenous peoples are still nowadays considered to be minors. It's a policy which can be compared uh, to, to the policy that was implemented by Canada in accordance with the Indian Act for, for a long period of time, uh, and uh, uh, wh where you had the superintendents who, who, who decided who could go outside the, the, the reserve and who could not go outside the reserve. In many ways, for instance, uh, until very recently, uh, indigenous leaders from Brazil if they wanted to attend a meeting outside, outside Brazil, they needed to obtain uh, a permit from uh, the government, of, uh, from FUNAI, the Fundación Nacional de, 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 de Brasil. Uh, so there's this totally unacceptable policy of tutelage. Uh, this is a state that has uh, ratified Convention 169, which acknowledges the existence the, 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 the existence of peoples and, and the rights to self-identify and so on. Overlapping of conservation initiatives on, on indigenous lands and territories, 
uh, it is, there's estimations that more than 70% of uh, uh, conservation lands are still uh, are overlapping with indigenous um, with indigenous lands and uh, the impacts, of course, uh, of extra extractive industries. This is one of the largest pro problems in, in the region. Uh, this large developments, mineral developments, uh, hydro dams in the Andes, in the Amazon, uh, they're, they're implemented with lack of consultation, without participation on benefits, and without compensation uh, for the damages that, that they provoke. Free trade agreements have a huge responsibility in, uh, in, in this, uh, in the proliferation of investments on the one hand, and, and also in the free trade agreements and bilateral investment agreements restrict the ability of states uh, to um, modify the conditions of investments uh, or the legal conditions uh, uh, in accordance to what are called the stabilization clauses. Uh, and this stabilization uh, clauses impede states uh, to um, make uh, relevant modifications to the legislation existing at the time of free trade agreements. And this, of course, violates the rights of states to self-determination. Uh, and um, the criminalization, the criminalization of social protest is also a huge phenomenon which goes from uh, Mexico to Peru uh, and down to Chile. And of course, there's many challenges. Um, um, uh, there's no legal mechanisms in many countries to enable uh, the restitution of ancestral lands in accordance to the jurisprudence that has been has emerged from from the Inter-American Human Rights Court that I already mentioned. Uh, conservation lands have, have not been restituted and and should be restituted to indigenous peoples. The IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation has encouraged states to uh, acknowledge a, a different figure of protected areas which are indigenous conservation territories. Uh, and why not uh, establish the category of uh, indigenous conservation territories instead of keeping control over indigenous lands? Uh, um, consultation and the right to free prior and informed consent is not accepted by most of the states in Latin America, notwithstanding the drafting, notwithstanding the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Human Rights Court, and notwithstanding uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, and the right to self-government uh, as a form of implementing the right to self-determination, although it's uh, in the Constitution, particularly of Bolivia, uh, it's not a reality, it's not a, possi a real possibility for indigenous peoples. The, the, the best example is what happened in the Tipnis a couple of weeks ago when indigenous peoples resisted the uh, declaration, so, sorry, the construction of a highway across their traditional lands, across uh, an area which was considered by the state to be a uh, protected area. So, so this is um, a, a picture of the huge gap existing between law and practice with regard to indigenous peoples in, in the region. Thank you.